everyone, I have the cat with me and she's dropping her fur and hair everywhere and it's making me snuffly and I love her very much. But she's quite whiny. Is everyone else's cat quite whiny? Let's see if she stays here the whole time. Today's little mini tutorial is going to be on positive and negative ion tests. It's a pretty unpleasant topic and unfortunately it's one of the only topics where you're literally going to have to rote learn all the colour changes. Unfortunately there aren't any hard and fast rules. And if anyone has any good rhymes or songs or anything, please link below so that you can share it with everyone else that's struggling with this topic. Now, why do we carry out these tests? Well, the point is, sometimes as chemists, we have, we have substances and we don't know what they are. So we need to carry out certain tests on them and then dependent on the results, we can identify the unknown substance. Now, we split the tests into two halves, into testing for positive ions and testing for negative ions. Now, remember an ion is a charged particle. It's something which has either lost or gained electrons. Remember, metals, they're on the left-hand side of the periodic table. They lose electrons in order to become full and have a full outer shell. When they lose electrons, it means they effectively have a positive charge. So, therefore, the first set of tests will be testing for positive ions, i.e. metal ions. Now the non-metals on the right hand side of the table, they gain electrons in order to become full and therefore they become more negative and therefore they will be testing for negative ions if we're looking at a non-metal substance. So those are the two halves and now we're going to start by looking at our tests for the positive ions. So you might have heard them about them before, they're called flame tests and you need to carry them out. Cat, you're literally covering me in fur, can you see that? Oh. Um, when we're looking at positive ions, we carry out flame tests. So they may ask you a three-mark question on how you carry out a flame test, a test, and what you would say is you get a clean nichrome wire. You could add the detail that it's been cleaned using hydrochloric acid. And then what you do is you dip it in the substance to be tested. And then at that point, you put it into the roaring flame of a Bunsen burner, or you could say you place it in a blue flame. And it's really crucial you say that in order to get all the marks available. Now, depending on the color change, will tell you which metal you have. So, the easiest ones for me are things like potassium, because potassium burns with a lilac flame. And I remember that because of potassium's reactions with water. Remember, potassium also burns with a lilac flame once added to water. Sodium, I remember it in the same way, because it turns the same colour as if you've added it to water, which means it burns with an orange flame. Now it gets slightly more tricky, because there are no, for me, there are no quick ways of remembering things like lithium, calcium. What you need to know is that they both burn with a red flame. And then lastly, you have barium, which burns with a green flame. So those are our flame tests sorted. Now what we can do is, if we're not going to carry out flame tests, we can do a precipitation reaction. And what we're going to do is add sodium hydroxide to our unknown substance and see what colour precipitate is formed. Now if you add sodium hydroxide to either aluminium or calcium, you find you get a white precipitate. The way you can distinguish between both of these is, if you add more and more sodium hydroxide, you'll find that the aluminium precipitate dissolves whereas the calcium one will remain, and so therefore if you've got a long-lasting white precipitate, then that tells us it's calcium. Other metals will turn other colours than white as a precipitate. Remember, a precipitate is just a solid which forms in solution. So if you have copper, remember the beautiful copper sulphate colours, that gorgeous turquoise colour. So remember, therefore, that copper will turn a blue precipitate. And then the only other things you need to know is iron, iron 2 and iron 3. Now, iron 2 turns green, iron 3 turns brown, those are pretty gross colours. Iron's annoying because there are two valencies, iron 2, iron 3, so try and remember that it's the annoying element and it turns a sludgy gross colour. Iron 2 green, iron 3 brown. So now I've finished talking about positive ions and now I'm going to talk about negative ions. Remember these are the non-metals and they occur on the right hand side of the table. Now, first of all I'm going to start by if the unknown substance happens to be a halogen, a halide, which is group 7, so we're talking about fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. Now, what you need to do here is add two very specific reagents. First of all, you need to add dilute nitric acid and then you need to add silver nitrate. Gosh, this is so complicated. Why is there so much? But just remember, it's nitric nitric. So nitric acid, silver nitrate. And the reason why you add nitric acid is because you don't know what that substance is. And if that substance happens to contain carbonate ions, what's going to happen is they're going to interfere and produce a totally different colour and a totally different reaction. So you need to add that nitric acid to remove any carbonate ions which may interfere. And I've seen that question come up so many times. Why do you add nitric acid? To remove carbonate ions. Answer done. This is a weird topic. Even if you don't understand it that well, if you wrote learn the colours and the odd perfect answers, things like that, I am going to attach some exam questions at the end, then you can actually get full marks without actually fully understanding the topic. 
Now, I've added nitric acid, I've added silver nitrate, and now the colour changes are as follows. As you descend the group, the colours get darker. So a chloride ion has a white precipitate, a bromide ion has a cream precipitate, and then iodine being at the bottom of that group is going to go a nice yellow colour. Okay, so remember, chloride goes white, bromide goes cream, and iodide goes yellow. So as you descend the group, the colours are going to get darker. Right, we're now going to test for the presence of sulphate ions, remember that's SO42 minus. And what you have to do this time is add hydrochloric acid, again to remove any carbonate ions which may interfere. Then you need to add barium chloride. And then what will happen if a sulphate is present, and it will be barium sulphate in that case, you will see a white precipitate. So if you've got an unknown substance, you add hydrochloric acid, you add barium chloride, and you see a white precipitate, then that tells us that the sulphate ion is present and the sulphate in question is barium sulphate. Okay, now we're going to be testing for carbonates, the carbonate negative ion. This is, for me, the most straightforward. So this time what you're going to do is you're going to get your substance and you're going to add nitric acid. Now if it starts to fizz, we know that that uh, gas has been released. We can test for the gas and it will tell us if carbonate is present, because if the gas is CO2, then we know the original substance was carbonate. And remember how we test for CO2. What we do is we add lime water, and if that lime water turns cloudy, then it has to be CO2. So if you were going to summarise to test for carbonates, you add nitric acid, there's fizzing, and you check that gas to see if it's CO2 by adding it to lime water. And if it turns cloudy, then we know carbonates are present. So now I'm going to add some past exam questions because this is difficult and you'll see the sorts of answers that they're after so actually it's not so tricky. The cat has managed to fall asleep on my lap which is quite an honour and she's not going to like it when I move. Don't forget to subscribe or comment and tell your friends too because I love hearing from as many of you as possible and I'll see you soon. Bye bye. As promised I'm going to talk through some past paper questions. So question five, low sodium salt is used on food. This label is from a packet of low sodium salt and it contains sodium chloride, potassium chloride and magnesium carbonate. A student tests the low sodium salt for the substances on the label. The same test can be used to identify sodium ions and potassium ions. Describe the test and give the result of the test for sodium ions and potassium ions. So they're asking for quite a lot here. Right, you need to describe here a flame test. So basically you need to, for the first mark, describe the fact that you placed the sample in the blue flame of the Bunsen burner. And now we need to talk about the colours it changes to dependent on if it has sodium ions or potassium ions. Remember that sodium ions are orange, the flame produced is orange, and for potassium the flame produced is lilac. So you're going to write for your first mark, place the sample in the flame, sodium produces an orange flame, potassium produces a lilac flame. 5a part 2. It is difficult to identify potassium ions when the sodium ions are present. Suggest why. Okay, this is more of a common sense question. You can literally just write something like the lilac colour for potassium may be obscured by the orange colour for sodium. 5b. Describe how the student would test a solution of the low sodium salt for chloride ions. Give the result of the test. Right, I just talked you through how to test for the halide ions. Remember the first thing you need to do is add dilute nit nitric acid, then you need to add silver nitrate solution, and then finally what will happen is it will turn into a white precipitate is if chlorine is present. If it asked for bromine, you would have literally written cream precipitate, and for iodine, you would have written yellow precipitate. 5C. To test for magnesium ions, the student adds a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution to a solution of the low sodium salt. A white precipitate is produced. The test also gives a white precipitate with aluminium ions and calcium ions. Describe how the student could confirm that the low sodium salt contains magnesium ions and not aluminium ions. God, they're so fussy, aren't they? So detailed, these questions. However, remember you just need to add more and more of the sodium hydroxide solution, so you need to add it in excess. And what will happen is that the aluminium ions will dissolve, whereas the calcium ions will remain. So, for your first mark, you're going to add excess sodium hydroxide, and for your second mark, you're simply going to say that the aluminium ions will dissolve. 5C part 2. Describe a test the student could do to confirm that the low sodium salt does not contain calcium ions. Right, we're going back to our flame test then, so what you're going to do is place the sample in the blue flame of the Bunsen burner, and what you'll see is that the flame will not turn red, because remember, red is the colour of calcium, so if there's no appearance of a red colour, then there can't be calcium present. So for the first mark, you'll write, place the sample in the flame, and for the second mark, the flame does not go red. Cool. Done. 
So here's another question on this topic. Question 7. The colours of fireworks are produced by chemicals. Information about four chemicals is given in Table 2, Complete Table 2. Right, this is going to have to be a rote learning exercise. You are simply going to have to know these colours. We've been told that barium chloride turns green. They want to know which iron is responsible for the crimson colour. And the iron here is lithium, because lithium, remember, burns with a red flame. Sodium nitrate, now remember I just told you sodium burns with an orange flame, so you need to write orange there. And then they've told us calcium sulfate is red. 7b, describe a test to show that barium chloride solution contains chloride ions. Give the result of the test. So the first reagent you need to add is nitric acid. Then you need to add silver nitrate. And then finally what you will see is a white precipitate will be formed in the presence of chloride ions. 7C. A student did two tests on a solution of compound X. Test 1. Sodium hydroxide solution was added. A blue precipitate was formed. Okay, it's worth getting your head in what this actually means. This means, remember, that copper is present. Test 2. Dilute hydrochloric acid was added. Barium chloride solution was then added. A white precipitate was formed. Right, this tells us that sulfate ions are present. Okay, the student concluded that compound X is iron 2 sulfate. Is the student's conclusion correct? Well, well, I just worked out that it's not going to be correct. Why? Because test one, these results show that copper is present, not iron. So that's the first reason why it's wrong. Test two, I just said, remember that barium sulfate is a white precipitate. So actually there could be sulfate present. So in order to get the, the three marks, just write for your first mark, blue precipitate indicates copper ions are present. And for your second mark, white precipitate indicates that sulfite, sulfate ions are present. And then thirdly, you need to write, but iron ions produce a green precipitate rather than the blue present, so that's why it's wrong. These questions are so hard. Just try and find as many as you can. Just keep going through them, wrote, learn all the colours, and you'll be fine. And if you have any other questions you want me to answer, just don't forget to link them to me down below in the comments. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>